Salesforce needs and then your training uh, and sales support plans. So you need processes to put all that stuff together in order to have uh, product success. Today, I'm Charlie, your online business manager and business coach. My goal is to assist small to medium business owners build their businesses with a focus on using the internet and online technologies in an appropriate and cost-effective manner. People hire me to take the stress out of managing their businesses and allow themselves to focus on what they do best. Today, my guest is David, and I hope I'm going to pronounce this right, I didn't check before the call, Frayden, who is a classically trained HP product manager and was then recruited by Apple to bring the first hard disk drive on a PC to market. Later, he worked with Apple as a business unit manager at the same level as Steve Jobs. I am so pleased to have Dave with us. I'm not going to tell you any more about him because I'm going to get him to tell us a little bit about himself. So welcome, David. I'm glad to be with you. I'm so glad to have you here. Look, mate, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I, I I kind of looked at your your bio when you said you bought the first hard disk drive to market, and I remember being one of the first people to install a hard disk drive on a computer over here. So <laughs> we go back a very long way in this industry. What can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Just a helicopter view. Who is David Frayden, and why are we talking to you today? consult on what I call product success uh, worldwide. Uh, my number one client for uh, training on product success or in the field of product management and product marketing is uh, the networking company, uh, Cisco. Yep. So you, you do business, sorry, product success and you can, and you actually consult with Cisco? Done a couple of consulting projects with them, but mostly uh, the last 12 years we've been trading their product managers. Uh, we've trained almost half of all of their product managers uh, worldwide. Wow, that's impressive. I mean, Cisco is a massive organization. I'm not sure if many of my listeners will appreciate how big Cisco is. I Again, this goes back because I've been in this industry a very long time. I was there when Cisco was a baby fledgling company making routers and actually cutting code on the client's floor to make their routers work. <laughs> So it was a very long time ago. Now, mate, you're also a um, author of a couple of books, yeah? Yes, uh, one of my books, I don't know if you'll be able to see it due to the blurred screen, is uh, called Building and Selling Great Products. It's, it's oh, reversed. Wow. <laughs> and uh, another book, uh, which Wiley published in India, it's only... Uh, uh, it's a little pamphlet, about 796 pages, and it's called... 796 uh, pages? Yeah, Successful Product Design and Management Toolkit. And I have a number of uh, courses on product management, innovation, um, uh, and, and uh, productivity and understanding how things, uh, products need to, to do to be successful. Uh, and all of that information is available through my website, uh, spicecatalyst.com. Uh, my books are available through Amazon in Australia and around the world. And if you just search on my name in Amazon, uh, all the books that I've written will come up. I will make sure I've got all of this in the show notes for people. Uh, I will go and look up all of those links and put them in the show notes for people so, so people can find your, your books and your website. Uh, I guess what I guess what I really want to talk about is product success and what that means and what people need to be thinking about. My audience will be small to medium business owners. Uh, they they will some. Sorry, I will stop. Pause. Take a deep breath. They tend to create their own products, whether they realise their product or not. And then ask about how do we market them? How do we get business? How do we how do we get people into our business to take on what we're offering? So I think this is a great source of a conversation for us. I think you've got a few keys that you want to discuss about product success, yeah? No, I have the lines of first 
word of my company's uh, uh, name, Spice, uh, Spice Catalyst. And the five letters of Spice is, uh, spells out a mnemonic uh, for uh, what to do to have a successful product. Uh, this is important because about 35% of all new products introduced every year fail in the marketplace, primarily because they don't follow these uh, keys to uh, product success. Uh, the S stands for a product market strategy. Uh, by that, I mean uh, understanding and having a strategy for the product in the market. Marketing is the act of getting people to go to the market. Think of a grocery store as a market, and marketing would be advertising in order to get people to go to that particular store. Uh, the P stands for a repeatable process. The I stands for having the information necessary to make uh, informed decisions. The C is perhaps the most important, and that is understanding your customer, who your customer is, why your customer uh, wants to do what they want to do, uh, how they want to do it, where they want to do it, when they want to do it, what's standing in their way or impairing them from getting it done, how important is it to get it done, and how satisfied are they with the current solution. And then lastly, the E is making sure that all the competencies and skill sets that a product manager needs is, uh, is uh, all the competencies and skill sets that the product manager needs are, uh, and I've identified 100 or 30 of them, are properly trained throughout the organization. Okay, so there's a few pieces of information there I just wanted to recap on. How many businesses fail because, sorry, how many products fail because they don't have a proper strategy? 35%. I'm sorry, 35%. 35%. One out of every three fail. That's amazing. That is so sad too, but that's amazing. Uh, and I did then just wanted to hit back on the, um, I'm, I'm going to go through all of these, but let's start with employees because you said there, there was 130 competencies that you'd identified that product managers need. Right. Can, can we first of all define what a product manager is and how that might work within a small business? A product manager is the primary person responsible for the success of the product. In a small business, usually the, the uh, founder or chief executive officer, uh, if they're not big enough to hire a dedicated product manager, they're the ones that have to perform uh, the duties of a product manager to ensure the success of their product and or uh, their service. Okay, excellent. So uh, the product manager is the person that, looks after the product once well do they uh, do they get involved with the development of the product or are they bought in after the product's been developed Actually, I, of uh, 32 elements being developed before you hand it over to the uh, uh, to the development team the engineering team uh, the coding team uh, otherwise, the uh, developers don't know who the target market is and what it is that the customer wants to do to make sure that they build the product that matches into what it is that the customer wants to do. Okay, so this is the person that is responsible from the outset of the product to, to get all of this information together to hand over. Correct. Awesome. All right. Now we get, we will probably come back to employees at the end of, uh, as we go through. I just wanted to get that sort of out there because as soon as you said 130 competencies, I could see so many people starting to panic in terms of, oh my goodness, that's a lot of things to know. I just want to sort of get that, that baseline there of this is what your product manager is. You guys are probably already performing this role without even realizing it. And even if you can take a little bit out of what we discussed today and start implementing it in your business, you will find that you have some success can we sort of go through each of these points uh I, and if there's something that you want to dive into specifically i'm good with that but if we start with strategy uh, and you said marketing strategy i'm assuming that determines what your client is looking for what the need for the product is how it might look how it might work i um, mean is that is that what the strategy is so it's it's a it's a market strategy, not a marketing strategy. It's okay. uh, it, consists, 
It consists of uh, detailing what it is the customer wants to do, what the product should be able to do in order to help the customer. And it consists of the market research, the uh, uh, competitive research, uh, writing personas of who your target market is, uh, product positioning, the value proposition, and then the various strategies for pricing, support, service, sales, uh, advertising, PR, uh, and um, all of that put together enables you to uh, hand that off to engineering and development so that the product is built with the value propositions built in that you've identified in your product market strategy. Okay, so I'm going to sort of paraphrase that just a little bit. Uh, that's about asking the questions first and getting the answers and writing the information to those answers rather than writing the answers first and then asking what the questions are, which is what I see so many salespeople and uh, business owners do when they start their business. It's like, I'm going to sell this product and this is what it's going to look like and or this service. This is what it's going to look like. This is how it's going to work. Oh, no one wanted that. That's not going to work for my clients. So what you're talking about is the market strategy is about getting all of that information up front knowing what you're dealing with absolutely um, a lot of people where i'm at in silicon valley uh, think that the way they have success like uh, facebook says uh, act fast and fail quickly uh, that just causes all sorts of uh, disruptions in fact uh, facebook just paid 1.4 billion dollars to the state of texas for failing to protect children's fo photos on uh, facebook from being scraped and used in uh, uh, photo recognition. Uh, they also, I think, paid a fine of a half a billion dollars to, uh, I think, Ohio, or maybe it was Illinois, uh, as a result of the same thing. And there's 45 other states that have sued them as a result of their act fast and break things and um, apologize later. Uh, that comes out of this notion of ready, fire, aim that some, uh, angel investors and some venture capitalists talk about. Uh, and I would say that you should ready aim fire. And the way you aim is by putting together your product market strategy with these 32 components before you hand it off to engineering. As opposed to most companies write it afterwards or they uh, write it concurrently while engineering is going on. When I uh, took over the Apple III product line, the first thing I did was uh, go talk to uh, Jeff Raskin, uh, and, who was the uh, chief architect of the of the Apple III, and later became the chief architect uh, for the Macintosh. And uh, I asked him, "Who did you have in mind when you designed this computer?" He says, "I designed it for the business market, uh, the the office market." And uh, but nobody in marketing knew that because they hadn't bothered to go talk to him. And because uh, the company did not write a product market strategy uh, before they uh, handed it off to engineering, uh, engineering figured out which market they wanted to go after, and they designed the computer to uh, appeal to that particular market. I, I I actually love those anecdotes. They're fantastic, and I'm kind of I'm kind of smiling because I used to be in the tech team. I, I was one of the techs, so I would be the one that would get these things, and then like go go and install this and work for the client. And here here's what we've got so far. And I'd be out there installing it, and then all of a sudden the salesperson would come flapping on in, going, "No, no, 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 no. That's what we need to do this now, or we need to do that." Trust me when I say the reason that technical people dislike salespeople and think that they are the worst people on earth is because it makes us more work. They give us more work and we don't get anything more for it. We just get a lot of curry because it doesn't work. And it's like, looks like you asked us to. Yeah, one of the big failures is um, salespeople will come back from a, uh, a meeting and they'll uh, – call engineering and say, or they'll call the product manager and say, and my customer or my prospective customer absolutely has to have this uh, feature and they'll describe the feature or they're not going to um, buy the product. Uh, one of my instructors is the former VP of product management for Nixdorf uh, Diebold, 
which makes uh, yeah. ATM machines. And uh, he said the president had dinner with a major bank customer like Bank of America. Uh, bank of America said that your ATMs have to do this, that, and the other thing. So they called up engineering who had to drop everything else, develop that new feature, uh, ship that new feature, and then uh, the customer, uh, prospective customer that insisted on having it never bought anything. So without the verification of talking to the market, to understand that there will actually be a market for this uh, feature that's a little bit off the beaten path. Uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, products, another reason why products fail, and in many cases, the reason why the company goes out of business. So how do you get around that one? Um, because that's a really, that that's a real conundrum, because our, our biggest customer wants this feature. How do you get around that? Well, first, you do the research by understanding what the customer wants to do across the target market and the, to and the, uh, uh, the total available market that you're able to reach. Uh, and you, you put together the C and, and SPICE, understanding the customer by first observing what customers do, uh, then interviewing them, then surveying a large enough sample, which is uh, projectable across the entire target market. And lastly, if you have big data available, uh, uh, utilize that. In terms of observing, the reason that's very important is that you can narrow it down. For example, you cannot ask, as uh, Henry Ford and as uh, Steve Jobs have said, you can't ask people what they need or they want because they have to understand what their problem is first and they have to design in their head the solution. And most people can't do that. But they can tell you, uh, if you just observe their behavior, uh, the problem that they have. Uh, for example, uh, if Henry Ford went out and asked people, would you like to have a car uh, back uh, in the early uh, 1900s when he was thinking about building the Model T, uh, they would said, no, I don't want a car. I want a faster horse. But if he had just sat on the stoop of uh, one of the saloons in Dearborn, Michigan, not far from where I grew up, he could have observed people beating their horses uh, to gallop through town faster uh, or, to, or to pull their carriage faster. So you, you observe first, like a social anthropologist, that based upon your observations, you put together an interviewing uh, questionnaire, and then you interview them. Now, if you're a business to consumer market, you talk to your target customers based upon the personas that you want to uh, target your, your product to. If it's a business to business enterprise, then you talk to your target customers and understand uh, what it is that they want to do. And then, like I said, you expand that to a survey across a representative sample of like uh, 800 to 1200 uh, uh, surveys uh, to be conducted. But if you have big data, that's great too, because you can then do uh, data analytics on it. But in the case of big data, if the internet existed back in the early 1900s, when Henry Ford was thinking about uh, building a car, and he did keyword research to see who was searching for car on the internet, he'll, he would have found that nobody's searching for a car uh, because no one knew that they needed a car. So he could have easily concluded that there's no market for cars, and therefore our traffic jams and our highways and our parking lots are merely uh, today a mirage because nobody really needs a car, nobody really wants a car. Uh, another caution about the big data is that it's based upon a computer science notion from Stanford Computer School uh, called Wisdom of the Crowds, uh, which gives us the referral engines of uh, like Netflix and Amazon. People who like this, like this. People who look at this, look at this. People who uh, buy this, buy this. Well, that's great if it makes sense, but it's also the wisdom of the crowd that's driving social media to amplify uh, falsehoods and fake news. Uh, and in fact, there's recent killings in England uh, uh, and riots in England is as a result of uh, some uh, unseen actors, possibly even Russians, that are spreading the rumor that the knifing at the Taylor Swift uh, dance party, where I think three uh, children were killed, was caused by an illegal immigrant. 
which turned out to not be true, but it's gone viral and everybody uh, believe, or a lot of people believe it enough in order to go out and destroy property and, and, and protest and riot. Uh, that has also happened in uh, India, where someone put out something, I think, on Twitter about some group of uh, Muslims that have killed cows. And of course, cows in India are sacred. And there were riots over that type of stuff. So the wisdom of the crowd's notion, which amplifies with the algorithms falsehoods as much as truths, uh, is another weakness of uh, the wisdom of the crowds and big data. And you have to be careful of that. And I've always said as an example that um, if uh, the crowd is so smart, how come every now and then, uh, someplace in the world, a bunch of people go into a nightclub, a fire breaks out, and they all try to get out the same door at the same time, uh, not yeah. realizing that <laughs> they go behind the stage is probably another exit. There are other exits, yeah. So, I, I again, just coming back to that wisdom of the crowds then, and I, I, we see it in the targeting um, algorithms on social media. Like you might go and look at something because, oh, I wonder what that is. It's not that you need it. It's not that you want it. It's just you have an inquiring mind. Or as sometimes happens to me, your finger slips while you're scrolling and you happen to hit an ad. And then all of a sudden you are inundated with this other stuff that's got absolutely nothing to do with you. Like you're not even remotely interested in it. But because someone you know somewhere along your connection line bought it as well now you must be interested in it too so yeah. big data can be very useful but you've got to really know how to uh mine it and and, and assess it yeah and facebook would uh, uh then start showing ads on your feed based upon your google searches and then even if you ask them to not put cookies on your computer and track you, uh, if you go to a website, you can tell what operating system they're running, what version, uh, what kind of computer that they're on, uh, and uh, maybe a few other data points. And uh, with the big computing power these days, you can match that up almost down to identifying who it is that's doing that surfing. Uh, and, and the other strange thing is uh, if, let's say, you get a relative that's has gotten sick and you search for the malady that you think is affecting them and for a solution uh, Facebook and Google think that you have that malady not, uh, not somebody else absolutely yeah yeah I, 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 I guess I cannot tell you how many times I've tried to help people out and then ended up with stuff that is all like no I don't want the okay whatever so let, let's just talk a little bit about that a bit further, though, because you were also talking about going out and doing surveys and such. If you are a small business and you were trying to launch a product into your target market, and I'm talking about someone who's probably got themselves and maybe maybe one other person, maybe a VA, uh, some, some subcontractor that they've brought on to help them do admi administration, how would they go about addressing some of those things that you've identified there like the surveys and speaking to their clients and because getting that sort of uh, information for a small business can be not only time consuming can be costly and they may not be able to get the sample sizes that they need well the first part of it, in terms of costly it's more costly to go out of business and waste all the money that you've uh, raised um, about uh, i think it's 2015 over 7,000 companies were funded uh, in India uh, by uh, angel investors and venture capitalists. Uh, as of today, I think just about all of them have gone out of business. So they've wasted millions, if not billions of uh, dollars in case of India, uh, rubles. Um, it's more costly to not do this work than it is to do this work. It would take uh, one person uh, calendar time, one to three uh, months uh, to get it done. Uh, uh, Time-wise, about one month worth of effort. Uh, so uh, it's best to invest the time and effort in understanding your customer uh, clearly uh, before you start development and start wasting your money. Uh, a few years ago, I was given credit in 2003 for having shipped the first advertisement on a cell phone. And so I had an engine developed that would enable uh, 
while playing a video game on your cell phone to have an ad be displayed. Uh, one of them was uh, Maui mountain biking, where you uh, coast down Haleakala, and if you crash and fall off the mountain, a, 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 a sign comes up that says, this crash brought to you by Sakuri running shoes. Well, I had the uh, uh, games and entertainment devices like uh, a virtual cigarette lighter called Light by Fire uh, and a virtual fireplace called, uh, I forget what it was, Fireplace, Fireplace or something like that. And um, I developed it for the Nokia cell phone because Nokia's marketing department told me that there were more Nokia cell phones in the world than any other phone. So I developed it. Uh, put it out there and immediately got 10,000 users in Europe. But in order to sell ads, I had a sales force in the United States. There was a disconnect. And the more I looked into it, it turned out that in the United States, only three Nokia phones were being sold at the time, three models, and uh, none of them had the uh, computing power to run my games. Uh, so, uh, I had a disconnect because I had not done the market research necessary beforehand. And by the time I figured that out, I'd spent all of my resources and uh, Maui Games uh, went out of business. It's a shame. <laughs> that sounds like a good game. <laughs> yeah. But that's a really that's a really good anecdote. Now, what about get, going out and getting samples, though, and getting those surveys? How do they get a big enough sample base? Well, there's a large number of uh, companies out there that sell a list. So let's say your target market is uh, educators. You can find a list broker that will sell, uh, sell you a list of email addresses for, those, uh, for your target market. Uh, with that in hand, the other thing you need to do is reward people for taking time to respond to your survey. Uh, these contests, some organizations say, if you take 20 minutes of your life, answer my questions, uh, we'll give you a chance to uh, win $500 or something like that. Well, that's hardly an incentive because chances are they're not even ever going to give away $500. So you don't know. Uh, so offer everybody a reward. Some companies out there will give you like a $25 Amazon gift certificate if you answer uh, their questions. And if you do that, then you're going to get a representative sample. And of course, as part of that survey, you're asking uh, demographics and genographics information that you use in order to put together a persona that describes who your customer is, uh, what are their likes, what are their dislikes, what are their weaknesses, what things are they afraid of, uh, where do they get their information from, which you could then later use for your target marketing uh, and so forth. And you also have some questions about pricing. Uh, if this product that we just described to you that does this, that, and the other thing sells for X dollars, what's your likelihood of buying versus Y dollars, what's your likelihood of buying versus uh, uh, you know, other, pr other price points. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I, I will uh, put that into the show notes as well, guys, so you can you can look it up and see what, what you need to do. I also believe there are some other survey companies out there. I think the G2 is one of them that will help you uh, do that sort of research. I know that uh, with a couple of these, I'm on their list and they'll say to me every now and again, come and review a product or come and answer these questions and we'll give you a $15 gift card. And I'm like, I'm I'm all there for the $15 gift card. $15 US is a lot of money for us. <laughs> so I'm all there for the gift card. <laughs> but they're very handy too because I get to see for myself what sort of things people are looking at, what sort of, what, where they might be looking into the markets. And I, I start to go and look and see, why would they be doing that? What are they up to? Because I'm, I'm a curious kind of person. Uh, now, you actually mentioned with his data as well that if Henry Ford had been developing the car, he wouldn't have because no one was searching for car. That is such a telling point to me because we all we tend to ask the wrong questions when we're out looking at what our clients are looking for and what our what our target market is looking for we and you mentioned finding out about what problems you're trying to solve is that the better way of doing it is sitting there and saying okay what are the problems related in this market so henry ford would have been transport would he have 
been better looking at that big data going well what are the issues that people are talking about about transport yeah very much so and you do that first by observing uh, and then by interviewing 40 to 80 of your target uh, customers with that you can eliminate the questions of things like when did you stop beating your wife uh, eliminate the leading questions and to Henry Ford's surprise he thought he made himself a motor car some people converted it into a truck so they're able to haul stuff around others converted it into um, a stationary uh, log uh, grinding uh, device others transformed it into a tractor and a, a motorized tractor which did not exist back then so people get very very creative once they have something available to them and generally you're not smart enough to figure these things out but if you observe uh, what people are doing and what they uh, want to do uh, then you can come up with innovative ways of, uh, of solving that particular problem now that is a <laughs> you, you mentioned that about the cars and i had to laugh of course you build something and someone will go and modify it immediately and go and do something you'd never ever considered it doing and go that's pretty cool or, oh my gosh that is so dumb <laughs> so silly why would you even do that but they do it uh i also remember reading recently that when henry ford bought the car out one of the first sales that he made or maybe it was even before Henry Ford pulled them out. One of the first sales of cars that was made was to the Defence Forces because the Defence Forces had a very specific need for motorised transport, but they weren't sure, quite sure how they were going to use it. So they went and bought some and saw, saw what they could do with it, pretty much. Yep. So Ford, do that with, was, sorry, go on. They're, they're doing that with drones now. And uh, just look at the innovation in drone technology. Uh, uh, as a result of the Ukraine war. Um, and in fact, I just read yesterday that uh, DJI drones, which are Chinese made, are being used to haul trash from Mount Everest, off of Mount Everest. Because people would climb Mount Everest and they would uh, exhaust the oxygen in the oxygen bottle, and they just throw the bottle away there. And uh, this uh, a cargo hauling drone can carry um, stuff that it would take 15 Sherpas and uh, six hours to remove from Mount Everest. And they do it in a matter of minutes, pretty much. Yeah. Or a fraction of the hours that it takes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And that's exactly right. It's not until something is built that sometimes it can evolve to the next thing because people don't realize the potential. All they really know is they have a problem then and there. And that's what you as business owners really are here to do. I'm, I'm going to lecture just a little. We're not here. We're, we're, sure we're here to sell things. Sure, we're here to make money, but we're here to solve problems. If we can't solve problems, we're not going to sell things. We're not going to be able to make money. We're not going to be in business for a long, for a very long time. So find out what the problems your customers are having and deal with them. That's the first, that's where I would first start. Uh, and David, he's got some fantastic ideas. So 40 to 80 surveys, that's not a lot of people, is it, really? So it's 40 to 80 interviews, uh, which interviews. might take half an hour to an hour each. Uh, 800 to 1,200 uh, surveys uh, where you send them a questionnaire uh, and ask them to answer the questionnaire, which can now be done very easily uh, online. And around what I'm talking about is that we're not smart enough as individuals or as groups to understand what the market will do. Uh, you let the market define uh, what it is that you should be uh, developing and building. An example of this is when I was at uh, University of Michigan in aerospace engineering, uh, the Apollo 16 launch was about to occur down at Cape Kennedy, and all three astronauts for that uh, mission were from uh, Ann Arbor, from University of Michigan Aerospace Engineering. So the school uh, chartered a uh, Boeing 707, and any student that wanted to go uh, could get on that plane and fly down to Cape Kennedy and watch the launch, uh, which I did. And after that, uh, they put us in buses and took us over to Orlando, Florida, which is in the central part of the state, where Disney World was under construction. 
and we met with the uh, chief imagineer. They don't call them engineers at Disney. They're called imagineers. And uh, somebody in the back of the room, probably in industrial engineering, who studies how uh, factories work and how people work, uh, asked, uh, how did you decide in Disney World where to put the sidewalks? And uh, the chief imagineer says, that is a really good question. Everybody else in my class, including me, laughed at the question. We thought it was pretty stupid. Uh, but the chief imagineer says, you know, we argued about that, the 100 imagineers working on Disney World, for three days. And then finally, one of the junior Imagineers says, let's not put in any sidewalks. And the chief Imagineer says, what are you talking about? We're building a major entertainment park. How could you build a major park without any sidewalks? He says, we're not smart enough to know where people are going to walk. So, and he said, let's just plant grass everywhere. And about three weeks after the park opens, we go out and look where the grass has been worn thin by people walking on it. And that's where we put in the sidewalks. So when I was writing my book, Building and Selling Great Products, talking about the keys to product success, and based upon my experiences with 75 different products across multiple markets, um, I uh, looked up pictures of Disney World, because I'd been there a while, and I was uh, surprised to find that there's no grass in the, entire pro uh, the entire park. They have put in sidewalks everywhere. It's one big concrete maze, uh, which illustrates that, you know, the point, let the market decide. Don't decide for the market what they want or what they need. I, I, I love that statement, let the market decide. I um I I don't hear it enough anymore. And it's such a it's such a powerful thing. I, I, I remember as a younger woman, we were in we were in um the start of a recession or a downturn or whatever you want to call it. And my my boss was like, Well, we're either going to grow or we're going to go small. I prefer to grow. So let's go find out what our customers want and give them that. And that's exactly what we did. And we survived it. But we let our market decide. We let our market tell us what, what they wanted. We, we had to revamp so many things to do it. Which then brings me to, I guess, the process part of your um, your your strategy there, your, your keys there. Process to me is one of the most important things in anything. If you don't have a good process, you can't, you're not going to have success. You said something when you were introducing it about repeatable process. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Well, I think it was Harvard that did a study that found that if you had a mature process where you repeat the same things over and over again and you're more and more successful, and you learn from your mistakes, your chances for success are enhanced. Uh, one of my clients that I consulted with made uh, Wi-Fi devices for uh, schools and hospitals. Uh, they shipped uh, five different ones over a couple, three years, and all five failed in the marketplace. And I asked the uh, VP of product management, do you have processes for putting together your product market strategy, uh, for understanding your customer, uh, for uh, uh, re revisions to your product and new product releases uh, and new product introductions and processes for all of this kind of stuff. He says, no, we don't. And as a result of that, we have a culture of blame where whenever the product failed, everyone would point fingers at everybody else uh, because they had bothered to have after action reports and discuss uh, what went wrong and what went right and improve upon that for the next product. So process is really, really, really important as a result of that. Uh, I There was something that I was taught, again, as a younger woman, I had a quality control person coming because we were going through uh, ISO 9001, which, trust me, no one ever wants to do. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a tough thing. Uh, and we were talking about, well, what do we do and how do we do it? And the the guy who was teaching us stood up and he said, all we want to see is that you have processes to deliver the same consistency of quality every time. We just want consistency. It do, this isn't about making great products. This isn't about making awesome things. This is about doing the same thing again and again and again and getting a consistent output. That's all we want from you. That hit me really hard because everyone thinks quality control is about or quality assurance is about 
you know, being the absolute best in the market? I, uh, I took over the Apple III product line in terms of full authority and responsibility in July of 1983. The Apple III was introduced in October of 1980. Uh, the product manager of that was a fellow by the name of Steve Jobs. And uh, the computers were shipped out to the dealers and they arrived uh, back in 82, uh, back in uh, 1980, uh, dead on arrival. They didn't work. You plug them in, turn it on, nothing happened. Uh, so they hadn't done any QA before they shipped it to the dealers of shipping one to themselves and see what's happening, what's going on. Uh, so they're co taken completely by surprise. And then they got service involved and they found that the chips would work their way loose from the circuit board. And that the way you fix it is you pick it up and hold it about a foot over the floor or over the table and drop it, which has caused the chips to be reseated, which is not exactly what you, uh, suggest to somebody when you've paid seven thousand dollars for a computer in today's terms that'd be about thirty thousand dollars you imagine buying something for thirty thousand dollars and you're told the way you get it to work is to pick it up and drop it uh, so that put a, a black eye over the entire product and the product line and it took uh, three years for them to dig out of that hole and uh, almost caused the company to go out of business because they had not done uh, the level of quality assurance necessary probably because they didn't want to take the time and there were some stories that they wanted to release the product before the company went public in the fall of 1980 in order to uh, increase the stock prices but that came back to bite them big time I think it cost really steve job. it did did it it cost steve his job as a product manager and then later when he did the macintosh uh, sales of the Macintosh were 100,000 in the month of, or in the year of 1984, uh, but by January of 1985, sales dropped to four units because there was so little memory on board, uh, you couldn't write a program to do much. Uh, and um, a few months later, as a result of that drop in sales, and also he had insisted a couple months before then that they fire all of the manufacturing reps that we had in the United States. So he decimated the sales force in addition to people finding out from developers you couldn't do anything with the Macintosh. And as a result of uh, those downturns in sales, he lost that job also. Uh, he was fired. Uh, then he went off and started the uh, next computer uh, and inappropriately positioned it in the marketplace. Uh, and thought uh, based upon his greatness that uh, his self perceived greatness, the people would rush out and buy it. Uh, they didn't understand what he had developed was a mainframe computer that could be used on a university campus by professors without having to stand in line for the, uh, the mainframe computer. They could have this mainframe computer on their desk. Uh, and because he had uh, so poorly positioned it in the marketplace, uh, the product failed. And in fact, when the Business Week reporter came into my office. I was the associate industry analyst and director of the personal computer industry service at a market research company called DataQuest. She says, well, I think of the next computer. I said, you mean last? And uh, that product also failed. And Steve uh, uh, started, a, 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 you know, that was his third failure in a row. Then I thought of my book, Building a Salient, researching my book, Building a Salient Great Products. That he sought out help from Dave Packard, one of the follower, uh, finders of uh, uh, founders of uh, Hewlett Packard, and I knew Dave because I had handled his personal PR when he first joined HP in the PR department uh, uh, years earlier in 1980. And uh, uh, Dave explained to him what it takes to have a successful product, uh, and told him, for example, don't be afraid to cannibalize your own product. But in the case of the Apple III, because he had muffed it up so bad he campaigned throughout the company to cancel the product line entirely if he had been successful in doing that he would not have had the resources to finish the development of his macintosh it, he would have been out of work and the company would have been gone uh, a lot sooner so when steve came back to apple uh, around 1998 he had already learned his lessons. Uh, he had also trouble with Pixar, which he came in and rescued, uh, but he corrected those things. Uh, and then later, uh, Apple has become very successful 
as a result of him following the blueprint that was given to you, him uh, by HP success, which by that point in time had been uh, increasing sales 20% a year, every year for 50 years, uh, following a repeatable process. Okay, so that that's a bit of a roller coaster of a story, right? <laughs> It's, it's really fascinating to hear behind the scenes because we all see the good stories. We don't hear the bad stories or the or the the lessons learned. I don't want to say bad stories. They're lessons learned. They're, they're, they're the hard story. They're the hard lessons that you've got to go through to improve yourself. So, guys, don't feel so bad if you're having problems. People like Steve Jobs have problems too, <laughs> and more than their well, not more than their fair share. They had more than we've ever had and will ever have, I think. But. For process, it's not just talking about um, the, the manufacturing process either. You were talking about the process for your product managers, weren't you? Correct. And uh, the processes for understanding what it is your customer wants to do, your processes for doing your market research, your uh, competitive research, your processes for identifying the personas of your target customers, the processes of uh, estimating your um target market size and how much that market known as the total available market that you can actually reach with your uh, marketing, uh, the processes for putting together your value proposition, your product positioning statement uh, for identifying new opportunities, for keeping your ear to the ground for changes of the market and the things that may impact your product in the future. Uh, those things I call the uh, perfect storm uh, which is things like the pandemics, food innovations, autonomous vehicles, climate change, and digital twins, uh, big data, augmented and, and uh, virtual reality, gene splicing, the digital transformation, the changing birth rates and, and aging po uh, populations like what's happening in Japan, uh, artificial intelligence, which is big right now, 3D printing, uh, the Internet of Things, marketing automation, uh, technology and platform innovation and robotics. All of those things will be affecting people's and companies' products and services in the future. Uh, when I first put together that list, I didn't have pandemic on there. Uh, and look at the impact that COVID had uh, to businesses and markets and people's lives uh, in terms of their careers and in terms of their health uh, worldwide. And you need the processes for um, pricing strategy, for budgeting, for uh, calculating return on investment, for putting together a product roadmap and a product por portfolio. Then you need the processes to launch the product, which consists of a budget, uh, uh, understanding your customer's journey, understanding differences in markets. For example, I was once approached by a company in India that wanted to do an advertising-based, text-based a program that's enabled advertisers to track the impact of their advertising through texting, uh, which they were doing in India, uh, and they wanted me to bring that product to the United States. Well, at the time in India, texting was free. People were not sending emails to each other. They were saying, sending texts to each other. In the United States, texting was 50 cents a text. So there's no chance that that product would succeed because of the market differences between those two uh, markets, uh, India versus the United States. Uh, and then um, putting together your, uh, your messaging based upon your product positioning, uh, your promotions plan, your packaging plan, your bundling plan, what media are you gonna buy and, and, to, and in terms of what mix, uh, identifying your distribution channels, uh, identifying the market anal analytics you're gonna use to determine our product success, your uh, content plan, your advertising plan, your social media plan, your public relations plan, your sales plan, the sales tools that the uh, sales force needs, and then your training uh, and sales support plans. So you need processes to put all that stuff together in order to have uh, product success. That is a heap of information and I am going to recommend that if you are going to go down this path, and I do recommend you do go down this path, you take it one bite at a time. Eat an elephant one bite at a time. Don't try and do it all at once and get overwhelmed. Uh, and I'm sure that there are some great resources and David's got some great resources that you guys can go and have a look at. Certainly his books would be a good start. 
Uh, David, why don't you tell us where people can find you? I know you did that at the beginning. It was spicedcatalyst.com was the website. Correct. And you can find my contact information there. <laughs> find out all about my books and uh, the courses there. Awesome. And are you also on LinkedIn, David? Yes. You just search for my name and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Awesome. I will have all of these links in the show notes, guys, so that you can find out more. I certainly highly recommend that before you introduce a product or service to the market, you go through the process and make sure that you aren't burning good dollars or throwing good dollars after bad by bringing out something that no one wants and then you're sitting there. It's not only just that you're throwing away your dollars, it's the impact that it has on you as a, mor a morale thing in terms of, oh, no one wants what I'm selling or I'm, I'm, I, I'm no good at this. That's not true. You just don't have the right tools in place to help you be good at it. So go, go grab them. Um, David, what is the one thing out of everything we've discussed today that you would like people to take, from, from, take away? Make sure you and your uh, employees and your consultants have all 130 competencies. Otherwise, you're going to fail. Awesome. And they, you people can get those out of your books, yeah? Correct. Uh, the uh, Wiley book, <laughs> Successful Product Design and Management Toolkit, has a whole chapter uh, detailing the hard skills and uh, soft skills necessary for success. Awesome. That sounds fantastic. Look, thank you so much for being a guest today. We are coming towards the end of our time. I would like to encourage people to come across and join my locals community, askcharlieletham.locals.com. I would also love it if you would like this video, subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell so you find out when our next interviews and my next daily content, which is my daily dose of business in inspiration drops. Uh, if you are watching or listening to this somewhere where you can leave a review, please leave a review. It does help us. And apart from that, David, I would love to thank you so much for your time today. It has been fantastic. Uh, well, and you. You, most, you are most welcome. Look, thank you so much. And, guys, I will see you all next week with our next interview. Have a great week, guys. Bye.